After a long, long, long wait, it's finally here. Our first teaser for Thor Love and Thunder, and it tells us uh, not a lot that we didn't already know, to be honest. Don't get me wrong, there is a lot already crammed into here. You have Thor getting back in shape, a new look for everyone's favorite rock monster, Korg, Valkyrie atop her throne as king, guest appearances from the Guardians of the Galaxy, a look at the MCU's version of Zeus atop Mount Olympus, and of course, the first reveal of a reforged Mjolnir wielded by Jane Foster as Mighty Thor. But you know what? That's all stuff that either directly carries over from Endgame or has been heavily talked about in the press over the last three years. You know, I, I just I just wanted something more, something a bit more plot related beyond Thor needs yet another movie to find himself. But then I looked a little closer and I found nothing. But then I listened a little closer and yeah, here's the thing. I think this teaser actually is telling us a lot more than we might think. Maybe even setting up stuff that'll be huge, not just for the Thor franchise, but for the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe universe, which, you know, would be one of the reasons they've kept this one hidden for so long. Call me crazy, I think the clue that unlocks it all is this. <coughs> Hold on. Is this. It, it's the song, okay? I can't play it for you without getting claimed to high heaven. Can we just play like three seconds? good as I'm gonna get. Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses. This song right here holds the big reveal to this entire movie in the very first teaser. A reveal that has nothing to do with anything that we've shown or talked about yet. And I'm about to decode it for you today. Hello internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that's asking you to start knock knock knocking on that subscribe button. That's a that's a, another Guns N' Roses reference in case you didn't know. Trust me, if you value being the person that knows everything before the rest of the world does, today is the day that I earn that subscription because I feel really good about this one. Plus, subscribing is free and really helps us out. Alright, you've seen the trailer, you've seen the reactions, you've seen the breakdowns, but you haven't seen this. This entire movie is spoiled in a single song. Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses. Third single off their 1988 album Appetite for Destruction and the band's only number one song in the US, believe it or not. But why is it here? Why is this song the one chosen for the teaser? Just a high-energy 80s song to set the trailer to, right? Wrong. You see, Thor Love and Thunder is being directed by Taika Waititi, the same director who did Thor Ragnarok, and wouldn't you know it, but he basically told us the entire plot of that movie in its trailer choice of song as well. We just didn't know it at the time. Just to refresh your memory, Thor Ragnarok was all about the Norse god Thor being sent to a foreign planet where he had to fight alongside his trickster brother Loki in order to escape. Along the way, he has to come to terms with Asgard's bloody history of conquest. The movie ultimately ends with them blowing up their homeland and leaving aboard a spaceship looking for a new place to call home. And now, let's revisit the song from the trailer. <laughs> Great, love, music, copyrights, that is all I get to play. That ah song is called The Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin, a song whose lyrics talk about all the stuff we just covered. First, taking the lyrics at face value, they're literally just talking about Norse mythology, with lines like Valhalla, I'm coming. So immediately there's a connection between Thor and the song. But then you have quotes in the song like, the hammer of the gods will drive our ships to new lands. Sounds like a bunch of displaced Asgardians on board a spaceship looking for their new home. And again, in the middle of the song, you have the lyrics, how soft your fields can whisper tales of gore. We are your overlords. Seems to me like a really strong parallel to the movie's exploration of Odin's bloody conquests and how Asgard, this beautiful realm, is built atop the brutal slaughter of other lands. I mean, even the song's name, Immigrant Song, tells us that this is a story where people are going to be displaced from their homeland, be it Thor landing on Sakaar, or again, the Asgardians looking for a new home at the end of the movie. In short, when Taika is choosing a song for his trailers, the thought process goes just a wee bit deeper than catching the old song go brrr, which is why we have to talk about Sweet Child of Mine for the new Love and Thunder teaser. Now, the song itself is pretty simple. It's a song that was written by the lead singer Axel Rose for his girlfriend, and the lyrics are all about a beautiful blonde girl with blue eyes who serves as a shelter or safe haven for him. For instance, quote, her hair reminds me of a warm safe place where I'd hide and pray for the thunder and the rain to quietly pass me by. And considering that this is a movie featuring the return of Jane Foster, Thor's girlfriend from the first two movies in the series, people are assuming that she's the sweet child of mine. She's the girlfriend that's being referenced here. The fact that she's taken up 
Mjolnir only forwards that. She's now a girlfriend acting as a protector for a boy that's tired of fighting. A boy who wants the thunder to pass him by. His hands were once used for battle, now they're but humble tools for peace. And yeah, that is a perfectly valid interpretation. It could just be as simple as that. Pretty much what you see is what you get. Girlfriend protecting boyfriend who's tired of fighting. Very literal interpretation of the song. Except I think that there are a couple elements of the song that these interpretations tend to overlook. First off, like I mentioned, the girl has blonde hair and blue eyes. Jane Foster in the movies it has neither of those. It's a superficial detail to be sure, but this is also a series all about a Norse family where everyone tends to have blonde hair and blue eyes. Thor, blonde with blue eyes. His mother Frigga, blonde blue eyes. The teaser even emphasizes the bright blue of Thor's eyes with an extreme close-up. The other thing worth mentioning though is that the girl in the song isn't just a girlfriend, this is someone who is specifically reminding the singer of being a child. A time when things were safer and simpler. The opening lines themselves read, she's got a smile that seems to me reminds me of childhood memories, where everything was as fresh as the bright blue sky. It's also worth noting that all these memories wind up as bittersweet. Quote again, if I stare too long, I'd probably break down and cry. There's a sadness about what's been lost here, and a longing to go back to that time. Later in the song, her hair reminds him of a place where, as a child, he'd hide. There's a family component here, a childhood component. And while Jane Foster could certainly remind Thor of his younger days, he wasn't so young that he was a child when he first met her. Watch what image the teaser chooses to open with. Thor running through the generations of his life. Thor as a kid. Jane is a human who met with him well into his young adult life. She doesn't have that sort of history. It's also worth noting that Sweet Child of Mine turns dark around the midpoint of the song, repeating the phrase, where do we go now, over and over and over again. Something has happened to prompt a new status quo. Where do we go now? It's an upheaval of some kind. Though that section of the song isn't in the teaser, it feels important to the narrative that it's trying to sell us. So if the Sweet Child of Mine isn't referencing Jane, then who is it? The way I see it, there's two possible directions. Ladies and gentlemen, it's double theory day. Or I guess it's triple theory day since it could just be Jane and we just talked about that. Anyway, theory number one, or two depending on how you're counting, the sweet child of mine is Thor himself. He's got blonde hair and blue eyes after all. The song could be from a parent singing about their child Thor. But what parent? After Dark World and Ragnarok, both of Thor's parents are dead, right? Right? Nah, not necessarily. He's adopted. In classical Norse mythology, Odin got around when it came to fatherhood. And in the Thor comics, it's more or less the same. So the subject of exactly who Thor's biological mother is has been a question kicked around for decades. For a while, it was assumed that he was actually the baby of Odin and Gaia, as in the planet. Literally, Odin hooked up with planet Earth Rick Sanchez style. Isn't it obvious, Morty? I fucked the planet. More recently, though, this has actually changed. See, as part of a huge Avengers storyline involving the Avengers, the Eternals, Loki, the Celestials, and the Dark Celestials, spoiler alert, but that's a thing, it was revealed that way back at the dawn of the universe, Earth had picked up its propensity for being full of magic users, mutants, superheroes, and all the other Marvel stuff, basically because the corpse of a dead Celestial had fallen here and bled out while the world was forming. When its Celestial friend Zagreb the Sorrower came looking for it centuries later in prehistoric historic times, he was defeated by a team of Stone Age superheroes assembled on the spot as the actual first Avengers. A lineup consisting of the first Iron Fist, the first Black Panther, the first Starbrand, Agamotto, as in Eye of Agamotto, the first Sorcerer Supreme, and a caveman ghost rider atop a flaming woolly mammoth. So why do I bring this up outside of being a chance to tell you that the Avengers of 10,000 BC is an actual thing that exists and we might one day see a flaming skeleton atop a burning woolly mammoth? Well, the story was actually written by Jason Aaron, the same writer responsible for storylines where Jane Foster becomes Thor, Gore the God Butcher decimates everyone, and where scenes like this happen. All of which, wouldn't you know, are being recreated in this new movie. In short, he's a guy whose influence is being felt all over Love and Thunder. In fact, all over the MCU right now. You know that mountain-sized petrified celestial that's left sticking out of the ocean at the end of Eternals? Yeah, that is right out of another of Jason Aaron's projects. The Avengers end up using it as their new house. Just saying, this guy's opinion matters right now. And as part of this ancient caveman Avengers, you also had Odin himself join the battle alongside a cavewoman, a mutant cavewoman, who, it turns out, was the first host of the Phoenix. Yep, the X-Men's Cosmic Phoenix Force. And it's worth noting, this isn't just a storyline that was randomly dropped. In 2021's also Jason Aaron's scripted arc Avengers Enter the Phoenix, the Phoenix Force returns as a villain, and cut to the chase that you probably figured 
it out, Thor confronts her and she calls him my son. The Phoenix Force explicitly says, you are the child of fire and thunder. It's yet another secret that Odin has kept from him for his entire life. And that's kind of where things leave off. Right now, the comic was left on a cliffhanger, waiting for resolution. A resolution that, once you know it, is slated for this July. The same month that Love and Thunder is scheduled to hit theaters. This whole time, we've been expecting the love part of Love and Thunder to relate to Jane Foster as Thor's ex-girlfriend. But what if it's a different kind of love? Parental love. The love between Odin and Thor's real mom, the Phoenix. Should we be putting all our bets on Thor's mom being revealed as the flaming space bird from the X-Men? Well, honestly, maybe. I mean, the timing, the song, the secrecy, the fact that more and more incidental minor X-Men stuff keeps creeping in at the margins, all of it seems to line up. It also ties back to the childhood themes that we were talking about present in the song lyrics. It would also make sense with the whole where do we go now section of the song. With an upheaval like that, I mean, where do you go? Thor is set more adrift than ever. So I think that there's a lot of evidence going for that theory. But Thor's mommy issues aren't the only Asgardian family drama to consume this side of Marvel Comics for over the past decade. A few years earlier, Thor and Loki also got themselves a surprise half-sister named Angela. And if you thought it was weird that Thor is now halfway related to the X-Men, Angela comes from another comic book universe at another comic book publisher. She's an angel from heaven, and she's one of the bad guys. Which brings us to theory number two, the sweet child is Angela, Asgard's assassin. Thor and Loki's long-lost sister, daughter of Odin, who, if you're into some of the various Marvel games, cartoons, and toy runs from the last couple years, you might have run across. You will pay the price for striking my brother! As far as characters go, she's a relatively new addition, becoming a Marvel character in 2013. But the story of how it happened actually stretches all the way back to the 1950s. You see, back in the 1930s, this Superman-like red-costumed character, now called Shazam, used to be called Captain Marvel. To spare you the details, in the late 30s, Superman was just really starting to take off in popularity, which prompted another company, Fawcett Comics, to introduce Captain Marvel, a character that basically had all the same powers as Superman, except with a twist. He was a boy who transformed by saying the word Shazam. And he was popular. So popular, in fact, that for a while, he sold more comics than Superman, even becoming the first superhero ever put to film. Which, fun fact, is available almost in its entirety on YouTube. I'll link to it in the description. Despite being 80 years old, it's really fun. Holds up shockingly well. I am Shazam. All is known to me. Your name is Billy Batson. But who is Captain Marvel? You are my son. All that is necessary is to repeat my name. Shazam. Shazam. Anyway, DC Comics thought Captain Marvel was just a shameless ripoff of Superman. I mean, they weren't altogether wrong, and they sued Fawcett Comics out of existence. However, as they tried to snap up all the heroes in Fawcett's roster, they forgot to trademark the name Captain Marvel, which allowed a small, unknown publisher to do it before them. The publisher's name? Marvel. This was why DC had to change the character's name to Shazam, and how Marvel Comics was born. It also prompted an independent publisher named L. Miller & Son Limited to make the character Marvel Man, a British superhero with the same basic power hours to replace reprints of Captain Marvel that were still popular in the UK. Fast forwarding the story a bit, Marvel Man would get rebooted in the 80s, retitled as Miracle Man for the United States, and get even more popular. But his stories would ultimately go unfinished when part of the rights were purchased by the creator of the Spawn comics, Todd McFarlane. The TLDR of this is that Todd was holding Miracle Man hostage to use as a bargaining chip against a fellow co-creator Neil Gaiman, in yet another legal battle he was having over ownership of Spawn characters. The main character in contention there, a very popular sexy demon-hunting angel named Angela. This case was way too drawn out to go into, but it lasted for over 15 years and ended with Marvel helping Neil Gaiman out. McFarlane ultimately loses, which grants Gaiman control over Miracle Man and Angela. As a thanks for helping him out, he gifts Angela to Marvel to use it as they see fit in their official 616 universe. And that is how a Spawn character, one of the few well-known comic series that don't belong to either DC or Marvel, ultimately wound up in Marvel's roster. Okay, as interesting and convoluted as all that is, here's where it actually becomes relevant to our theory today. When Marvel had to explain how a literal angel from actual heaven was now hanging around the Marvel timeline, the gimmick they came up with was to have her pop into reality following a multiverse-breaking event, and subsequently discover that she was actually an Asgardian. Specifically, she's Aldrif Odin's daughter. Very subtle there, guys. Odin's firstborn, who was believed killed, but actually stolen as a baby during a forgotten war between 
between Asgard and a race called Angels from the long lost Tenth Realm, a familiar looking place full of pearly gates and self righteousness called Heaven. Spelled differently, H E V E N. Completely different things. Certainly weird, but still not as awkward as that time when Ghost Rider teamed up with Jesus more than once. Since then, Angela has been all over Marvel in her own series, in the Thor comics, as a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, sorry, as a member of the Asgardians of the Galaxy. Usually in search of her one true love, Sarah, who also happens to be one of Marvel's original transgender heroes. So a lot is going on with this particular character, but could any of it plausibly make it into this movie? Well, we know in the comics that she came to the Marvel Universe because of tears getting ripped in the multiverse, kinda like the ones that just happened in Loki, and in Spider-Man No Way Home, and probably in Doctor Strange 2. We also know that this new movie is visiting places like Mount Olympus and characters like Zeus. In fact, more and more we've been seeing real-world mythologies getting represented in the MCU. Obviously, North mythology has been represented since the beginning, but now we have the Grecian gods here, the Egyptian gods over in Moon Knight, the mythic creatures of ancient China in Shang-Chi's Ta Lo. Thor was a myth, and now I study him in my physics class. In Love and Thunder, we're supposed to have a main antagonist called Gore the God Butcher. With a name like that, you're gonna need some gods to butcher. And in a movie where you're already visiting Mount Olympus, it would make sense to potentially also visit a non-secular place called Heaven to join forces with, or fight against, some sort of angel army. Plus, based on these shots here, we know Thor is gonna be spending time in outer space. Notice the moons and sun in the sky. This is not Earth. We also know that he's spending a lot of time with the Guardians, and those tend to be moments when Angela appears most frequently, in space with the Guardians. We also know that Valkyrie is apparently swiping right for a new Queen of Asgard. Day one as King of Asgard, what would Valkyrie first change in new Asgard? As king, as new king, she needs to find her queen. So that would be... And Angela is a prominent Thor franchise character you canonically can't rule out for that matchmaking. It's also one of the last times that you can potentially use her as Thor's sister. As old Avengers hand off their roles to the next generation, Thor is kind of the only one left. Cap is gone, Tony's gone, Natasha's gone. That leaves Thor kind of alone. I guess Hulk's there too, but regardless, it feels like we're getting close to Thor having to make his move. So if he's gonna have a strong, angelic warrior sister reveal, now's the time. But most of all, I like how it works thematically. Thor has nothing left, his family is all dead, his homeland is exploded, his friends are spread across the universe. To have a sister, a friendly non-murdery sister as opposed to Hela, show up from another universe and serve as an anchor for him? Give him a way to reconnect and find peace with his childhood? Yeah, that'd be pretty great. And bringing it all the way back around to the song that started it all, it fits. A beautiful woman connected to a lost childhood with bittersweet undertones and a dark twist that prompts the question, where do we go now? Yeah, that is Angela in a nutshell. So there you have it, friends the two potential twists of Thor Love and Thunder. Thor's mom is secretly the Phoenix Force, or Thor's secret sister emerges from the multiverse. Or, you know, sometimes a song about a girlfriend is just a song about a girlfriend, and getting Jane Foster back to don the suit is enough in what looks to be an already packed movie. Either way, we're gonna find out in a few months, or who knows, maybe even a few days when the multiverse tears open in Doctor Strange 2. Strap in, friends, it is 2022, and Marvel is back in full force. It is gonna be a big year. Because I don't know if you forgot, but Black Panther 2 is also supposed to release in November, so we got a lot coming down the pipe. As always, my friends, remember, it's all just a theory. A film theory. And you know they say that a healthy body is made as much in the kitchen as it is in the gym? Or, I suppose in Thor's case, giant alien dungeon cave? Well, if you're working towards looking more like pre-endgame Chris Hemsworth rather than post-endgame Chris Hemsworth this summer, I have one recommendation for you, and that's our sponsor for today's episode, HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal kit service that offers you step by step recipes that help you effortlessly save both time and money with the food that you're eating. Something I've always found intimidating about cooking is the work that it can require, both in terms of preparation and in cleanup, but HelloFresh offers a ton of quick and easy recipes that just melt the stress away. Each of the recipes have super easy to follow step by step instructions and pre-portioned ingredients, meaning that I'm always winding up with the perfect amount of food and not wasting a bunch that goes bad in the refrigerator. It's also super easy to adjust our plans and increase our order size on the occasions that we have friends over and we want to dazzle them with our amazing cooking skills. Or, you know, we just want leftovers the next day. It's also cheaper than going out and eating at a restaurant. Up to 72% cheaper. And the food is just as good, if not better. Because HelloFresh's recipes are delicious. They have 50 weekly options that'll have you salivating. They pull recipes from all over the world. Want to try something fancy? Well then, treat yourself to one of the top-of-the-line premium pick recipes every week. Or, if you're more in the mood for a side or a dessert, check out the HelloFresh market for all your snacks 
snacking needs. If you're looking to eat healthier, HelloFresh can help you reach your goals with their range of veggie, pescatarian, and fit and wholesome recipes, so you can always feel good about your food choices. Me personally, my goal is to look as good as Jane Foster's biceps. And help me in that quest, HelloFresh can inject more protein into my diet. It has super flexible options for adding, swapping, or upgrading proteins each week, including in their veggie dishes. Speaking from personal experience, HelloFresh's food is delicious, the instructions are super easy to follow, it saves me time in the kitchen, and honestly, it makes me feel like a halfway decent chef every time I follow one of their recipes. If any of that piques your interest and you want to try some amazing food for cheap, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code FILMTHEORY16 to get up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. They say there's no such thing as a free lunch, but with HelloFresh right now, you can get up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Again, that is going down to the description below and clicking the link or going to HelloFresh.com and using the code FILMTHEORY16. F-I-L-M-T-H-E-O-R-Y 16. Get yourself some free food that's not going to make you feel guilty and honestly, it's going to make you feel great for all the time that you saved going to the grocery store. Check it out right now. HelloFresh, thank you for being such a great sponsor of this channel and for also being a great sponsor of my diet. Because man, if it wasn't for you, I'd just be eating like McDonald's every single day of the week.